and we are a smaller group, but there's, there's a big advantage, so we can we can work more intensively. I'll have time to go around and help you. Uh, let me just check. You none of you probably never used it, right? Or you you tried some? You used it. Arsag. Okay. So uh, yeah. So today's focus is we will do also some saga GUI because I want you to get familiar with it. But the, the mission is to really um, uh, get you using uh, um, R and Saga jointly. So you do statistical and geographical computing and you combine it. And you will see it can be done very elegantly. Um, and so I, I do have to emphasize I'm not a Saga GS developer. Uh, most of the courses that you listen uh, Geostat are run by the developers, so the people that actually make software. And of course they know the best about that software because obviously they make it so they know the most about it. Um, um, and I never uh, contributed to any Saga module or anything. But um, uh, I, I know a lot about uh, Saga GS and I, I know the people that developed it, so I can, I can be a good pointer toward them. And I'm a, I'm a um, um, frequent user of Saga GS, so I use it on a daily basis. Okay, so I'm, I'm a right person here to give you this course. Uh, so you have, you can see the, the program of the course on the, the course website. So we will have uh, four blocks. And uh, in the first block it will be still a bit uh, introduction and theory. And then we, on the end of the first block we will, we will try to install Saga GS. Uh, then in the second block we will look at the R Saga. And then in the third block I will do a bit less teaching. I will, uh, I will give you some exercises. I will let you, I will let you uh, do things. Uh, for about half of that block, and then the the last block we are going to I'm going to run the whole exercise for you, so I'll show you how that looks like. Okay, so if you want to follow this, uh, um, if you want to follow this lecture, it, I think it's enough if you just go to this URL because it's all it's all here. So you, either you have a link to something, or you have you can also just look at the slides. So I'll open the slides. So, uh, by the way, as you can see here from the from the main from the title slide, I, I give a pointer to the Saga GS. There's a Saga GS development team, so there's a group of I think three or four people, and there's also a link to uh, Volker. Volker was the person that was teaching Saga GS at Geostat last two years, but he couldn't make it to this Geostat, and um, so I, I decided to uh, replace him. And also there's a uh, our Saga library, which is not developed by the Saga GS people, is developed by a person in Canada. He's also German origin. It's, his name is Alex Brenning, and so he is. Uh, he was uh, kind enough to develop a, a package, which uh, is a wrapper that uh, allows you to more easily access uh, Saga GS from R. And so, uh, so that's these two things are developed independently. Okay, I have to emphasize that. And so what happens is sometimes if they decide to change something Saga GS, then Alex has to update his package, but he doesn't update his package on a, on a daily basis. So sometimes you have, to, you have to write an email that says, look, I'm trying to do this and this thing doesn't work. Usually what it means when there's a new version of Saga GS, there might be some broken links between R Saga and Saga GS. And then Alex will probably point you and say, well, just use the old version of Saga GS. Okay, so as I said, my objective for today is to um, introduce you to Saga GS, the basic design and functionality of Saga GS. We will work also with the Saga GUI, so we will try to open some layers. Um, and I will show you how, how you can uh, visualize rasters, do overlays, how you can uh, inspect properties, how you can select a piece of a spatial object and get properties. And so. I really, I really like Saga GS because it's also very light. It's a light software. You install it quickly and you work with it quickly, and it loads a big data, and it can crunch big data. And so the, the bad news for the people in the other room, they are learning uh, raster package, but the raster package is, is not going to be able to crunch big data. So Robert has to like really program and still improve the programming in R, uh, while the Saga GS is C++ implementation, and so it's made actually to work with also with the big data, and you can work with the big data, so it's very efficient in that way. 
I also want to give you some time so you can, if you brought your own data, you can, you can start working with your own data and then you can call me and then I, we can look jointly at what you're doing and if you say, well, how did you do that? I want to do that with my own data so I can help you with that. Um, so it's a, it's a very powerful, on the end of the day, so my mission is to convince you that R plus AgaGS is a, it's really powerful combination of software because you have, so you have so many strong things um, and so many possibilities to do analysis in R and there's and there are really uh, unique functions which are available on in R, in Saga GS and if you combine the two you have a really powerful combo to do statistical and geographical analysis and which is by the way that's really the spirit of Geostat is to um, have the statistical and geographical computing combined. Uh, this thing I said already so I'm not a Saga GS developer at least not yet um, if you later on, if you discover something uh, technical, if you follow this link, uh, this will get you to the Saga GS mailing list, and also there's a discussion forum. So I think at the moment the person sending most of the replies and doing this is Volker. So he's, by the way, Saga GS is all a bit. Uh, it's a German pr uh, product, so uh, I think most of the developers are German, and and most of activities happen in Germany. So it's a bit of German GS. So they, they should be proud of that because it's a really, I find it a very good GS. Also, Grass GS is a, a big group of people developing Grass GS. They're also German, so somehow Germans are really good into supporting the open source GS and doing lots of stuff. And there are also quite some literature. Many of the literature is uh, freely available, so you can just uh, download the PDFs and read. Uh, personally, for a long time, I was just using this one. Uh, so this is the, let's go here. So this is uh, Olaf's uh, PhD thesis, and it is still for me the best uh, resource to check things about Saga JS. Uh, there's only one catch, it's in German. And uh, so that's a bit of, it's a, a slight problem. Uh, but you can see here that, like, the main design of Saga JS and uh, functionality and examples, it's all here. Uh, so it's really well explained. Uh, but as I said, it's in, it's in German. So that, that uh, could be a problem for some of you. Um, and also what many people say when they open Saga GS, they say, well, you know, when I go to, when I open, let me see. So I'm, I'm here, so I'm going to start Saga GS. And so when you go to this, the help, um, the help menu, and then if you go there and you say, okay, now I want to get some help about some command, or I want to know what it does, how does it work, there's very little documentation. And that's, that's very common actually in open source that you know, people are carried by developing code that allows it to do processing. So I put this thing here. So that's uh, Saga GS. So if I go here to the help, I say, okay, help. And then it takes me to the, to the wiki page, but you will see there's lots of things that are just unwritten. It's just small pieces. Okay, so I, I, cannot, I cannot find all the, uh, so there's lots of text which is unfinished. And so I ask Olaf, Olaf Conrad, who is the main, uh, so who person who wrote most of the code in Saga GS, I ask him, you know, so where can I find, I mean, I want to use some function, and where can I find, it, you know, like a documentation, like a, uh, you know, help documentation, what it does. And he says, well, it's there. I said, where is it? Well, it's there. How do you mean? It's, it's open source. You just open the code and you read what I do. And I said, okay. So I took the code and it's all C++. And then I looked at it. Mm, I'm, 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 I mean, I still have to learn C++, but I said, well, this is really... It's, it's quite abstract, just the thing. But he says officially, yes, if you, if you want to know what happens, you can see in the code. So nothing is hidden. I mean, of course, it's open source. Um, but you see, somebody who's a skill in computer language actually will prefer to look at the actual code than to read somebody's documentation what something, what some function does. Because if you can read C++, then you see, okay, this function does this, this, and this. So there's no mistake, right? 
And if you if you read just in a, a documentation that you know you go okay, more so person can say does this, but maybe it doesn't do exactly what the person say. So uh, ultimate ultimate remember that in open source the ultimate um, documentation is the source code. The only problem is if you cannot speak that language, then then you're a bit stuck with that. Um, so what happens is that uh, there's not so much documentation. Uh, except for these few references I put you. And so what, what we scientists like to, uh, we, where we like to help, we try to produce documentation for Saga GS. And so, uh, so we, we, we like to translate just this core C++ code, explain it in a somewhat plain language what happens. And so there are, there are different sources that you can follow. Uh, and of course there's the Alex, uh, uh, Alex wrote a lot of uh, documentation for uh, uh, Saga GS, and he wrote a package, the R Saga, so that you can you can follow on his pages also lots of materials about Saga GS. Uh, yeah, maybe I should mention this one. So this is a paper we publish in an open access journal, and it's a um, reproducible research paper. So. You, the things you see in the paper, you can you can reproduce yourself, and that's what we want to try to do. Although uh, computing takes a bit longer time, so we're not going to do 100 simulations. We're going to do 10 simulations because otherwise you will run it for half an hour. So and that's that's really inefficient. So we're going to run some computing, which is a bit simplified. We're not going to get the same result, but we're going to get something similar, like from this paper. So um, and this paper is a it's a it's a published by Copernicus, so it's a bit new concept of publishing. I think you're all researchers, I will assume, right? So uh, uh, in this concept of publishing, you, as soon as you send the, the paper to the journal, you have to accept all the conditions and things, and it's uh, open access, so you have to pay for the processing, it's, which is about two or three times cheaper than the commercial publishers. And, and then they publish immediately the paper. So the paper gets very quickly online, but uh, uh, they have two journals. One is called Discussions, and one is the if the paper gets accepted. So with some people, it happens it doesn't get accepted, so it stays kind of in a limbo, and you cannot withdraw it. So once you accepted it, you submit it there, they will put it there. So you take responsibility if your paper is flawed or has problems. If it's not flawed, it doesn't have serious problems, it will eventually get published, and then it goes in the official journal page. Okay, but the papers get very quickly online, and uh, anybody can submit comments, and anybody can uh, ask questions. So it's, uh, it's, it's called a, it's, so it's an open access journal with an uh, open, open access review system. So you can, it's all transparent. You can see the reviews, and you can see the first version, and you can see the last version of the paper. You can see how the paper evolved. So of course, the, a good paper will have a little revisions and go quickly online to the journal issue, and a paper which is more tricky will evolve. Now you ask yourself, well, what do I want to see? You know, that people are not used to that, see some paper evolving. But I actually find it very interesting how the paper evolves. Actually educates me also about how people work and, um, and, and I can see the, what are the problems with some, I learned about these people that wrote the paper because I can see what, how they evolve their, with their work. So actually it's an extra dimension of information. It's something like in Wikipedia, you know, many people in Wikipedia you just read an article, but there's the whole discussion also, and you can see the history of an article. You can see how this article changes from day to day or from year to year. And that's also another dimension of information. It's like a multi-dimensional information. Anyway, so that's about uh, this paper. So we're going to run things from this paper, which I actually embedded in my package. I embedded chunks of the code, and so we'll, we will run small chunks of the code, but they're a bit complicated. So I, I prefer that we go for less code, we're not going to do a lot of code, we'll do less code for the exercise, but it's a bit more complicated. So we'll be running something and then explaining, okay, why do we do this thing here? I wrote this funny paper at maybe five, five years ago, six years ago. Uh, we had a workshop in Zurich, at the uh, Zurich University. And we had one day Saga GS, one day Grass GS, and on the end of the last day, so it was Saturday, Sunday, on the end of Sunday, we asked the people to fill in the web form, and I think there were 35 participants, 
and they could rate different aspects of Saga GS and Kraus GS. And I think it, uh, Saga GS more or less won that competition, <laughs> because mainly because people found it much, f you can install it faster, you can find your way faster, and it's a more simple design, while Kraus GS is a more, more comprehensive, so uh, the advantage is it's more comprehensive, so there's more things there, there's more possibilities, but this advantage is that when people just want to start working with it, then it, it slows you a bit down. It takes longer time to install. Also, there is the issue that this GraphGS is, of course, developed by an, under open source, and so most of the developers are Unix, uh, Linux users, and when they s just start teaching it, I think maybe five, six years ago, there was like only like experimental Windows versions of GS. Now there is an installation for the for the Windows also for GS, But so that was also something that put some people off because I think you all you're Windows users now, right? No. no? Okay, but now at, at the moment you have Windows machines. I will assume you have a Linux. Okay. Well, nevertheless, I also use both. I mean, I have Ubuntu and I use Windows. Uh, I do have to say, you have to use at work uh, Windows because I, otherwise I cannot access lots of network uh, data. Um, so, uh, so now this thing is sold, but at that time there was still a bit much less for the uh, Windows users. So anyway, you, this paper, I think if you just click on the image, then it will you will get a PDF also, so you can read. Now, Volker also has this uh, tutorial, um, which is from the last Geostat, so if you follow the link, you can see that tutorial, and that's more really in-depth, because Volker is now one of the people that maintains the, he maintains the, the mailing list, I think, and he also takes care of the new releases of Saga GS. Uh, so there's a, if you, we recorded already now three or four geosats, so you can, I don't know, did you, did you try looking at some videos from the last geosats? No? So you can go and you can look, for example, Grass GS video, Saga GS video. This one on a Saga GS video is actually is quite good. It's, uh, it's about two and a half hours. Um, and so as he goes and explains, uh, like, going from basic things to uh, doing, uh, uh, working with the point clouds, working with LiDAR data, working with big data. They even use uh, Saga GS to do um, analysis of uh, uh, point clouds in uh, um, medicine. So they had this 3D model of our, a skull or something, and, and so they were analyzing it in Saga GS. So, so uh, if you give the right tool to the people that are creative enough, then really sky's the limit. I mean, they'll. They'll figure out the ways to use it that you cannot imagine. So, of course, it has a there's a sound and vision. So you can nice thing about the video tutorials is when when the tu when the course is finished, you can always go back and you can play and you can say, "Wow, this went too fast. I I I lost it." Because we go this is really intensive course, so we go very fast. And then so when we video record, you can always go back and you can just. Pause it and then you take your time and you go slowly. Okay, let me see what he's doing. So actually, uh, the way I learned to use a Drupal, uh, which which I use for the website, is that I, w I watch the video release. So every time I have some problem with the Drupal, I go and I watch a video. Then I slow down and I try it. Then I play further. Okay. Then I slow down and I try it, etc. And that's and that's how you you can you can teach yourself. So that's very efficient. So so there's this. Uh, Video which is more which is more in depth about, for example, uh, analysis of lidar data in Saga GS. So not something I will be doing today. Okay, so this is this is the uh, the software triangle that I use at my work. This is how my desktop looks most of the time. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a primarily R user that then likes to import uh, GS functionality from Saga GS to Grass GS, and I made this uh, package to visualize from R to uh, Google Earth. And I actually I use the the color palettes from Saga GS, so you get a very similar display quickly. 
So the display I get in Saga.js, I get in Google Earth. So what I do usually, I will run some analysis in Saga.js, then I look at the map in, uh, sorry, I will run the analysis in R, then I look at the map in Saga.js, and then I look in the Google Earth. Google Earth is important because you can do validation directly, because if you, if you have a wrong coordinate system, then it's shifted. Uh, if you're using, if you are, uh, for example, doing soil mapping and I have water body, and I see pixels are falling in the water, then I, with Google Earth, I can do quickly, I can do validation. Or if you do land cover, uh, mapping, whatever. So I can quickly validate. And with Saga.js, I can, I can actually look at the uh, values in the pixels. You will see that's really nice. I mean, you have a big image, and, in, and once you zoom in, you can see actual values of the pixels. And you can also uh, query uh, directly with a, just graphical, you can query. Like what uh, Robert Hymos was doing in R, you know, just select and do this. So you can do that also in Saga.js. It's very user-friendly, actually. GUI is quite user-friendly. But that's, that's kind of my triangle. Of course, you have to find your own triangle, I mean, or whichever shape you're going to work with. Um, but that's that's mine, and and that and as I said, I, uh, I use this also for big scale projects. I mean, we we have projects working with a huge data, so uh, so it it is operational. I mean, you can really do serious projects. So projects like of five years with a uh, really large data, and so you with the lots of geographical, with the lots of statistical analysis, you can do this with this software. Okay, I mentioned this word geocomputing. So just to clarify, what, the, what do I mean by geocomputing? So, um, so obviously it's a, it's a computing with a geographically uh, reference data. And uh, also what you could say, it's a computing with GS layers. So um, obviously it's about doing coding, so programming, analysis, and it's about doing, working with GS layers. So when you say geocomputing, it's, so it's a computations on, on your GS layers. Connected terms is uh, geoinformatics, automated spatial data analysis, and so on. Most of computing I do at least is we always tend to automate everything we can. Everything we can, we will automate. And I, will, I surprise myself every time. I surprise myself how much I can automate. Things I thought, okay, this is going to be difficult to automate. Uh, if you have the right tool, and if you start, you know, playing with combining things, meshing up geographical statistical analysis, suddenly, wow, I can automate this. Okay, so um, I can show you some examples of that, but I amaze myself always how much I can automate. And now the beauty of automation is, okay, I, I, I cut myself out of my work. So, you know, they say the best, the best teacher is the one that becomes obsolete eventually, or the best programmer is the one that best uh, uh, spatial analysis is the one that becomes obsolete. Yeah? So uh, eventually I cut myself out of work, but it's a, it's a beautiful feeling that you can automate, so you can, then you can speed up and you can go and do something else then. So you say, oh, this is solved, we will automate it, it's going to run like this. Okay, Saga.js, so it's an abbreviation for System for Automated Geoscientific Analysis. It's a GS software. Uh, it runs under Windows and Linux, and there's no version for Mac operating system as far as I know. Uh, and they switched to open source. For some time they didn't know what to do with it, and then they switched to open source, and that's really, it's, it's really good for lots of people, but they, because there are lots of users of Saga.js. Um, there's less users of Saga.js than Grass.js, so that's no doubt about that. Uh, but there, there, are, there are quite some users, and uh, also Volker told me that what interesting thing about Saga.js is that people tend to use it and uh, requires less support, which is, on one hand, it's a good news, because it means that people don't have so many problems, they figure out how to do things, but the, the bad news is that you don't see really lots of traffic. There's not really, on the mailing list, it's not RCG, I mean, you have like 20 emails a day or something, and on the Saga.js you get, you know, a few emails a week, so there's not so much traffic, so you, you, there's a kind of a feeling like, okay, this project is not so dynamic, not much is going on. Uh, so this is the main developer, Olaf Conrad. He used to also come to Geostat uh, and teach, and he's, uh, he works at the uh, University of Hamburg, um, Department of Physical Geography, and he's together with Jürgen Berner and uh, Andre Ringeler, and so they are the core 
Saga development team. And there's the also Sealens uh, company, which also develops and uses some Saga GS modules, but okay, they're a private company and they also will do a Saga development and compilation for commercial purposes. So if you say, look, I would like, I like the Saga GS, that I want to really run it over a whole country and I need to, you know, do lots of processing and we have to deliver on time. Then you go to Sealance and they say, we, you know, we're going to pay you, I don't know, $100,000, but you have to develop all these things, right? Because it's a, it's a private company. So then they will develop, they will customize the Saga GS for you or they will customize some modules or they, they can also just run the processing. They can do all the processing and they just deliver your GS layers. And then also uh, Volker, is, uh, he was working for the laser data company and he was in, uh, in Austria. And so they also do uh, development. Uh, they also have a Saga GS workshop sometimes in uh, Hamburg or somewhere else in Germany. And I think they also meet, they have a Saga GS development uh, workshop. So if you get really interested in Saga GS, don't forget you can, you can join a bigger group. So there's a bigger pool and you can also work with them. This is their download, uh, so I think web traffic and download uh, sites, and you see it's really spread all around, but majority, majority is of course uh, in Europe and uh, US, majority of users. Um, so you can, today you can look at Saga GS, you can, um, you can see, oh wow, this is really, I really like this stuff, I would like to use this, it looks very powerful. Um, and then, so don't forget when you finish with the Geostat, don't forget one day that you can either contribute to Saga GS, it's open source. Uh, you can also hire them. Uh, so as I said, there's a company that will do things for you. So please don't forget uh, that it's open source and you know, it depends on you. So it's not, it's not something, hey, I would just want to buy a copy of a software. It doesn't work like this. So if you want this thing to keep on living, you have to also give it a push. So you have, to you have to support it to contribute. Okay, so they released the uh, Saga GS in 2004. I think the first version of Saga GS was in 2001, but before that, Olaf had some other software he was making mainly for DM analysis, okay? So he made some software, DGEM or something, and it was for uh, uh, mainly for digital uh, analysis of digital elevation models. And then they said, okay, this looks good, but now let's make it a bit broader. So they extended it. So went from, okay, just DM analysis, now let's make something more general. And then they call it a Saga GS, System for Automated uh, Geoscientific Analysis. And then in 2004, they decided to release it as open source. So it was a good decision. It's, and it's really great for us because we can, um, we can use it and it's all transparent, so you can see what happen what happens. And since then, there were there were lots of lots of changes and additions. And you see, they went from 119 modules to now uh, 569 modules, I think. So that's quite extensive. In, if you compare that to the raster package, which they are doing in the other room, I think it's probably double. So that's two times more functionality. And all this functionality is uh, in C++. So uh, it's, uh, it can work with big data and it's fast. And we are going to work with this version today. There will be some problems, so I will talk, you also, talk about that also. There will be some problems when you do things from R. And uh, usually what happens is that, unfortunately, Olaf, from version to version, decides to change the argument names, which is he has complete freedom. This is open source. I mean, he has no responsibility towards anyone. So he changes an argument which is called apple to orange, okay? So for him it's no problem, but all my scripts don't work anymore. If I get the new version of Saga GS, my scripts don't work anymore. And some people discover that and say, wow, that's really frustrating. I mean, I make the scripts and, you know, it's open source and I send it around, but you change, you change the argument names. And this thing, in, for example, in our community, they're much more gentle with that, so they're much more careful and then don't, they don't tend to change the argument names. And if they change, there's also a way you can change the argument names, but then the old argument names will still work. So there are tricks to do that. But while well, Olaf, which he just went, no, I don't like this name, Apple, now it's called Orange. Or he will move some module, which has a, the modules have, they're numbered, 
So then he moves a module which is number one becomes module number two, but your script doesn't work anymore. So your script will uh, typically work only with the specific version of Saga.js. And that's what people in open source don't like. You want to just get a new version and just keep on updating, you know. Or updating your software is very common in open source. I do it also on a weekly basis. In a commercial software, it's not so common. You, you stuck with some software, basically. You use it for a long time, and then you know if you want to update it, you have to get a license, you have to install it, you have administrator rights, blah, 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 blah. And it's very slow. But with the open source software, you just go puff, puff. I mean, I can get all the, ver all the new version of my, the software that I use on a daily basis for big projects. I can get it in maybe half an hour I can install. If I have a bandwidth, in half an hour, everything, I mean, I have everything ready. You can even get the operating system you know, if you use Ubuntu, you can get it in one hour with all software, no problem. Mm. Right? There's a 1.3 one, one, one already? Ah, so this one was just, I think, last week. So, well, that's good. They, they, they do lots of changes. It was funny thing that they, you see, when 2004, 2005, da, da, da. So it's been like 10 years, and they went only from version 1 to version 2. And then some people say, oh, this saga just got stuck. It's not, not changing anymore. But that's also kind of, it's, for me, it's irrelevant if they call this version 2 or if they had a version 5. I mean, it's a bit subjective in software. They said uh, the major, major revisions is when you go 1 to 2, right? So these are major change, major changes in the architecture. And so I actually, I don't need some lots of changes. I don't think there's many changes in the architecture of saga .js, uh needed so what the only thing is needed that you know if they get a new um, functionality or module then then it's included so they say well this saga GS is still on a version 2 or something and if you look at the grass gs do you know the last version of grass gs uh, something like f four six seven point one yeah so you're thinking oh yeah this grass gs is developing much faster and yeah, yeah, because you see, like, these guys are already in version 7. And it's something like the PlayStation and Xbox, right? The PlayStation has PlayStation 4 and Xbox. Uh, uh, and so they, they said when they have this, when you say we're going now from PlayStation 3 to PlayStation 4, so lots of people think, wow, this is now some major change. But it could be that they change just the shell or something, but there's not really huge changes in the, in the architecture. So I think with Saga.js, I don't mind that they are still on a version. To my my biggest problem was this thing that the the developers were changing the arguments names, which for me also doesn't make sense because if you call it a Apple, and if I know it's something, and if you then ch maybe ch make some edits to the description of what it does, why don't you just call it Apple still? It's, for me, it's no problem, right? But he he yeah, it's a it's open source and all of the people that develop. They have a freedom to change things, so I mean nobody can stop them. Uh, so that's what Volker also said. Um, the uh, user forum and mailing list is often very quiet, um, and some people said that since uh, version two six years ago, there's nothing new exciting there. Rather slow development, new secondary. Um, Modules and bug fixes. Well, I don't think that's true. I think when you look at this, uh, when you look at the the growth of the modules, so look at this. This is 570 modules. And if you if you buy RGS and if you buy all these toolboxes, you get maybe 350. Okay, and this is 570. Now, when you get the Saga GS, so there's enormous amount of stuff there. There's so much stuff that I have to put it in a text file. I have to put it all in one text file because that's the only way I can search what's now available. Because it's difficult to see what's available. And so that's why I do, I run a script where I extract all the help minimum help documentation which is available. And then I put it in one text file. And then I can search it. So I search by keyboard, a keyword. And then I say, OK, well, I can do this, I can do that. So I did that for you. Uh, so I will show you that. So that's this uh, file you will you can find on the 
So here, this bolded file, you see this? Over 450 functions. So if you, if you load it, then you get this file I prepared for you. It's just a text file. And what, w the reason why I put it in a single file, because now I can search it. Like in R, you know, when you want to search for some function, I said I want to do overlay. And you open R Studio and you say overlay, and it shows you all the, because it's all, all help documentation has to be written, otherwise you cannot commit a package on R. But with Saga.js, there's no requirements. I mean, it's the, they're on a loose platform. You see, there's no really platform for Saga.js. There's the OSGO, maybe. Uh, so they also compile it for the OSGO. But it's a, it's a bit loose platform. So that's why I extracted all the text. And now I can go here and I can do Control F. And I can say overlay. So then I get, oh, actually I get only one. Ah, oh, interesting. So I get just the Saga uh, grid visualization and there's an overlay image. Um, but that will be maybe then extract. Extract a subset. Actually, I forgot what's the terminology for overlay. Let me see if I look at the shapes. Grid. Grid values, okay. So then I'll have to search grid values. Uh -huh. Add grid values to points. You see? So that's the way I can find it. And I can see, OK, that's in my um, shapes grid DLL, dynamic library. And so the, the function is the full, full name is add grid values to points. And these are the arguments I have to use. You see? And these are all the possibilities. So I can have a one grid or I can have a multiple grids, and I, I can use a shape file as an input, and it has to be a point, point uh, vector. And then I get the results, and I can even choose the interpolation. For example, this thing is not available in, in R. To do this thing, you, you won't be able to do that in R. Do you know this inter the concept of interpolation? So if I have... So if I have a grid, and uh, the if I, if I will overlay exactly at the center of the grid, so this is called the grid node, then the if I had a point exactly here, then the the best estimation the the value of that cell is the uh, the best estimation what is in the grid node. But if I have a point here, OK? Now, if you do, if you do overlay in, in the uh, SP package, there's an over function. And what it does, it just takes this value. And you can do that also in uh, Saga.js. You will say nearest neighbor. So this will be this thing. But you can also say, well, um, I don't want to use that because this point is actually it's very close to the, these other three pixels. So I, I want to use some other method that also takes these values. OK? And then you say, well, what do I use? Well, I can use a bilinear. That's a, taking a four neighbors, inverse distance. So you, that, that's kind of inverse distance. Is, it's kind of mechanical interpolation. So it's just the, the you know, points which are more closer, they get a higher value. And you can also do spline. And this, is, this is, becomes a bit more computing intensive if you have like million points or something. So be careful with that. But then the splines, they kind of also allow you to do, uh, to downscale your grids. So imagine if you have a, you have a, a D, digital elevation models. And if you look at this representation, this is simplified representation of digital elevation model. But you can assume that the, surf, the, the topography is smooth. So the topography doesn't go like this, right? That's topography doesn't go like this. You can imagine the topography is probably something like this. So then when you do a spline, overlay and spline, so then you will estimate that the value of elevation for this point will be this. 
You see? And in, if you use R, you won't be able to get that. Well, you can program it, so don't get me wrong. In R, you can program it so to do also this interpolation before you get the value. But you have to, you have to make the code. If you use default function for overlay in R, you won't get this functionality. And, and so this is, this is kind of when you look at Geostat also, what the idea of Geostat is, that there are many things that are strong in R, and they're much better to be run in R, but there are many things that are much better in the GIS software. And so no R package can yet still be compared with like Grass GS or Saga GS. You see, Saga GS has 570 functions now. Okay, and there are, there are uh, state of the art implementation of many. You, you will have about 100 functions in Saga GS, which you won't find anywhere else. And so um, you could go and re implement something in, in R. You can say, well, I can re implement this. But why? There's, you know, if, you, if, you really, if you're carried by application and by use, then you can just do for some data analysis and testing. And you say, wow, this looks really good. That's exactly what I want. And then you just combine the two. And you can mesh up the code, and you can combine geographical and statistical computing. So you can have in one line you're doing something in uh, uh, Saga JS, and the other line you're doing something in R, and you can combine it. Okay. In many cases, there's a parallel analysis. There's exactly the same type of analysis you do in R and in Saga JS, and you get exactly the same values. And that's also nice. I did lots of exercises like this. For me, that's also nice because. It proves to me that I understand what's going on. I understand, I, I understand, okay, they maybe call it different way, but I know the mathematical theory behind, and I know what's going on, and I get exactly the, the value I, I should get. Also, if I, if I just calculate by hand, I get exactly the same. So that's, that's a nice thing also to experience when you say, well, I assume that they should get the same, exactly the same result, and you get the same result. Sometimes you get a wrong, different result. And this, this doesn't have to be because of there's a different analysis. It can be also due to rounding of numbers, um, um, due to bit slight differences in implementation, right? But that's also then also nice to, to realize what these differences are. That, uh, all these things, when you do in open source, when you, you, know, you understand the theory, you look at the code, and you say, well, should come, this should come out, and then you see, okay, exactly what you expected comes out. That's a nice... It's a nice news, news for you because you say, well, I understand what's going on here. And, you, and then you feel confident about software. You feel like, wow, okay, I understand what these guys are doing, and I feel confident I want to use this. Did you manage to find this uh, text file? Now, this text file, I made it. I made a code to make the text file. This runs about 20 minutes, so you don't have to remake it. But what, what will happen with you, I, I bet you you're going to use the text file because that's the only way you can quickly search through all the things that are available. There's no other way to search through SagaJS to see what's available. Well, there is another way is that to get the source code. If you get the C++ code, you could maybe search the so source code, but they might not have put all the explanation of things. So I have my own uh, small contributions to Saga GS, you can say. Okay, we're going to start. Uh, so we have uh, about 40 minutes until the coffee break. So we're going to start with uh, installing the Saga GS and looking at the Saga GUI. Uh, so who said you use the Saga already? You use Saga? No. Who said you use Saga GUI? You just use the GUI, right? And you never got any training in using Saga GUI. Okay, so you had the Saga Saga GS within a course. Okay, okay. There are some courses in different universities where they also use Saga GS as a primary software. Yeah. Um, I heard that it's in, in Eastern Europe is quite popular, uh, but of course in Germany, uh, in Hamburg, they will do everything in Saga GS. Uh, but also I see that many people use a GUI and there's uh, some tricks with GUI also, and then it's good to introduce 
Saga Gui in systematic way, so I will do that also. Although I'm not probably the best person because I tend to use less GUI but more the command line. Uh, but the, I, do like, I do like to open uh, maps in Saga GS and it, you, I open maps which are like seven, eight gigabytes. Okay, that's no problem. And I like to think about Saga GS that I just go open and it will just, the time spent will be spent really on opening that file. And when, when you load some big GS software like ArcGS, you know, it would just take some time just to load that software. Um, and what we will do, we will do some analysis with the point and click. First we go point and click, so you just get familiar with Saga GS and then say, okay, now let's, let's program that. Because I told you also yesterday when you start doing serious projects, you're not going to do point and click. Right? Who's going to do point and click? If you have to do 100 maps, you will just say, well, you first you will think, okay, let's hire some students. Let's get some students and they will go, but why? You know, you can, you can just program it. You can make very compact code that repeats like hundreds of operations, so even 10,000 operations. Um, so that, that can be all done. And that's what I want to teach you. I want to teach you how to automate the whole thing. Uh, this is the, the Saga GIS GUI. Uh, so it has um, standard way the things are organized. Uh, so when you just start the Saga GS, you don't have to f follow me now. I'm, I'll just talk about it, and then we'll start installing. In about 15 minutes, we'll start installing Saga GS. And you see, it, it has a really actually simple interface. It has kind of a, a toolbox. You start with the toolbox, so you can there are all these uh, cascaded functions, and you can see if I will click some function, then it will uh, give me this. Uh, uh, window and typical structure, it's a, it's a very simple structure, it's like with the R functions, you have the inputs, you have the parameters, and you have the outputs. There, there are some also modules which are interactive, so you will start a module, then you digitize something, then you uh, uh, stop it or you save it. So there are some interactive modules and all non-interactive modules, they're always the same. You have the inputs, you have parameters, you have the outputs, so it's a, it's a very simple uh, structure. You, there are things that you have to uh, define and the things that are optional. So things that will be defined by, by default. Uh, then you can you have a data browser. I have no data now in loaded in my memory. Um, and once I load the data, I can also look at the data as, as thumbnail, so it will create small images, so that's quite nice. And then when I create maps, maps are also saved as a separate objects. So if you add several layers to a map, so it's a, like a collection. Then you can, you can play with that map, you can export it to PDF, and you can also do cartography with the Saga GS. Um, then below this, here I have my, I see my file system. So it shows me where I am. So what's my uh, current working directory. And you can also work with uh, ODBC or PostgreSQL. So this will read any type of database, and this is mainly for uh, spatial databases. So you could have a live data from a database and you just do a query and you get a chunk of that uh, in the Saga GS. And then here you have a, a window which is if you run something, then it will report, report what you run. So as soon as I start Saga GS, I have a, um, I have a function load libraries. So it loads uh, some libraries and there's also, uh, if you do execution, it will show the execution that it runs. And if there's an error, it will report an error. Then once we, once we get some layer, then we can look at the uh, settings of that layer in description. There's also some things that look that are hidden. You see, if I click on this no items, and I get, okay, there's no layer selected, there's nothing to do about this. But if I click on the maps, then I get the general settings. So maybe you didn't know about this, but before you start using Saga.js, you can also set up some general settings, so they're, they're a bit hidden there, somewhere there. Um, so you can say, I, w I don't want to have a scale bar. Every time I open a map, I don't want to have a scale bar. And then I will have to say apply. And now these settings are um, uh, uh, saved. So this is my uh, customization of Saga.js. If I turn it off, And then if I turn it on again, 
then you will see that this settings has been saved. So every time I start my Saga JS, the way I customize it, it will always stay the same. Unless I reinstall Saga JS, then I have to customize it again. These are, yeah, these are the program settings, basically. So, um, so if I go back to the map, uh, where was I? Maps, yes, and I said, you see, show scale bar is turned off. So it's been saved. Uh, so what happens is like when you do uh, tools, you have also this setting. Uh, so there's this beep, beep when finished. You see this beep when finished? So typically people are annoyed with that. <laughs> and uh, so a good thing is, well, maybe, maybe you want to have it on because if you're working on multiple machines, it's good to have the beep when the operation is finished. But for now, I will, I'm going to turn it off. And I do have to say apply. If I don't say apply and if I close it, then it's not going to save it. Apply it means, okay, um, accept this change. So that was a, a bit about just a short about uh, GUI. Then we, so we have this um, map layouts. Uh, so we have the map views, then we have a print layouts also. So when you want to make real cartography, uh, you can make also scatter plots and you can look at table data and uh, you can play with the properties. And you will see when once we start opening the layers, they organize either into uh, uh, raster collections or into vector collections. Raster collections, they're just uh, gridded uh, maps, and the vector collections, they can be point, polygonal line. There's also, I think, thin. Um, so there's also thin structure. And then you can also, I think, have uh, tables, and so, and so there will be a bit different icons, but it's, it's very easy to see, so. Uh, so that's just the GUI. So we will start with the GUI, and we will play with, with some data sets, and then you will see there's a, an enormous amount of DLL dynamic uh, libraries uh, which, which do different things. And in dynamic, uh, dynamic libraries, usually one file uh, contains uh, a collection of functions. And so within what is called a library in Saga GS, it's a, don't get confused with the uh, R library. So what is a library is basically one DLL file, and this one carries different functions, which are usually uh, specialized functions to do something. It can be only, within one library, it can be only one function. So that's also possible. But it can be also 20 functions. And then these functions, they are called modules. So that's the terminology of uh, Saga GIS. I'm sorry about that, but don't get confused when I say library in R and I say a uh, Saga GIS library, or if I say Saga GIS module. So don't get confused with that. And there's the also API for Saga GIS. So you can also do, you can, you can call Saga GIS modules from Python, and you can also automate analysis from there, and you can build up uh, modules, you can build up all your own virtual modules using the Saga API. So I, I think they really prepared it in a proper way so you can uh, use it from a, uh, like just a uh, real graphical user interface all the way up to using really the core functionality for your purpose it, extending it and so on. Plus you can make your own Saga JS modules. You can, you can take Saga JS source code and if you get the programmer, you said, well, I want to have this analysis, but like this, then the programmer goes um, and codes and extends something which is existing in SagaJS, and then you compa compile your own version of SagaJS. And that's what several companies do, actually. They will take something which they like in SagaJS, and they will compile it and add their own functionality. But then they can use it only in the house, and that's fine. If you use it in the house, if they will go and say, no, we want to sell it, then it's a bit, there's a bit of problem there, because if they have their own added value and they just sell the added value, then it's fine. But if they take existing open source and they just add something and they want to sell the whole thing as a commercial package, then they break the license. Okay, then, then Saga GS um, development team could possibly sue them. Yeah, because they break the license. Okay, so that's, that's a Saga GS. Now there's also a, a package in R which is called R Saga. Um, and this one is only compiled to the version uh, 2.1.0. So officially, we should have been using this version, but I tested some things with the 
1.2 and it also worked but there's a warning message so what Alex did he will check your version of Saga GS and it will print a warning message says look I didn't update be careful this is you're working uh, uh, with the version which is beyond what I uh, checked and so be careful there might be discrepancies and that usually means that the Saga GS developers might have changed some argument names or some parameter So we will be working with the uh, Saga GS 1.2, uh, 2.1.2. 2, 2, so let's let's install Saga GS, okay? You never did it uh, before except for you, right? Yeah, so so we can do it. So there are two ways you can do this. Uh, I would like to try first the automated way. <laughs> okay, let's see if that works, and then if it doesn't work, then we'll try manually. Okay? Okay, so I'm going to install Saga GS from R. Okay? So, um, so I start my R Studio. And I'm back to the things that I was doing yesterday. So it, R Studio also memories where I was, but I don't need some of these things, so I will turn them off. And I don't need this. Um, well, I will I will leave it just in case because there's some examples. And I can check my working directory. So I'm in I'm in a wrong working directory also. So I'm going to switch. Uh, working directory to uh, D, DR course, so that's my working directory for this session. You can have your own working directory, I don't mind, but please work in one working directory, don't, and make sure that you know where you are. And that was the mission of yesterday, so to warn you about installing the packages and setting up the working directory. Should I do this set working directory one more time? Oh, it's very it's clear okay so so I'm now in my uh, working directory where my script is um, I think I have to change it also here let me just check I'm, I'm not sure why does it, this doesn't um, doesn't do uh, the R studio doesn't do it by default so I have to do it always by hand so I'm not sure about that. But here's my here's my working director. So I can see it in my R session and I can see also in a R Studio browser. Okay, so now what I made for you, I made a, I made a function which is called install saga. I made a R function which goes downloads uh, binaries and does the install. So the function is called install underscore saga dot r. So what I do, I save that function, which is a small file. I save it into the R course. And now I can open it. I can say open with R Studio. So here I have that function. So we will look at this function. I just made it uh, yesterday, I fixed it a bit. So we can take a look what, what does the function do. So don't please don't run it uh, before we, we, we look at it. Because it could be that I also uh, did some mistake. I was, I was quite tired as the, actually from after the course. Uh, so what I made a function which has a, a Saga local directory parameter. It has a Saga URL, so where the Saga GS is. And I have the Saga version. And I can also uh, specify the name of the Saga zip file. 
Okay, so I make a function which will go and try to install Saga GS. Now, Saga GS uh, in R requires, so first, if I want to download the Saga GS, I need the RCURL, R curl, also called, and I need the package R Saga. And you see here in this line, what I do here is that I, I check if R Saga is not available on my machine, then please go and install it and load it. So that's what this line of code does. You can test that. I mean, if I... First, you can test this. Let's see what happens here. So you see this one says false. So if I run this thing on my machine, because I already have our saga, it will just go and load our saga, and it will say it's false. Can you see this code here? Is that, is that code clear, the thing I have in one line? So this uh, exclamation mark means, uh, so, uh, so if I have a true, it can, it, it's opposite. Exclamation mark means do opposite thing. So if I do opposite true, it gives false. Okay, so I said, if, if our saga is not available, because this check if it's available. If, if this is available, then it will be true. Uh, sorry, if it's, if it's missing, then it's true. And so then if it's, so, in, and so if you convert that, so if, if it's missing, that it's true, and then install it. And once you install it, load it. You see I put a, a semicolon. So it runs two things. It runs this one and then this one. But I just put in one line because it's, it's, for me it's more elegant. Is that clear to you, the, the command line, or do I have to run it? Excuse me. Is it clear for you, or should I? It's clear. Okay. You can see it also here, right? So you see I made this function where um, I want to do everything properly. That's, of course, when you, when you want to make a function which is robust, then you have to do it the way that you do checks. So you don't go doing something that works only on your machine. That so that works on any machine. And so, and if you want to do that, you have to do the checks. And you can, you see, I can also check what is my platform. Am I using Linux or am I using Windows? So let's say if I use Windows, so my, I can see my platform. So it says my platform is Windows. So if it's a Windows, then, okay, then we go, okay, now we do these things. Now we do this chunk of code. So if it's a Windows, I do this chunk of code. If it's not a Windows, then the only thing I can assume it's a Linux, and then I do this chunk of code. Linux is a much shorter code, but yeah, this, this thing will work only on Ubuntu. That's a problem. So if you have a different, I didn't have time now to, I could have developed this further, but I didn't have time, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you if you if you fix this, please send me the code, and I will put it also online for other people. If you say if you can do here a check, if it's this uh, distribution of Linux or that distribution, then do this, then do that, and I can put it also for other people. If you if you are if you are a Linux uh, enthusiast. I do not know uh, what is the reason why this is. Why yeah. Is yeah. Okay, so for now I just, I made it very simple as I know, that works on Ubuntu, and uh, if you, somebody has a solution, please send it and then I can also check it. So let's go back to Windows. Um, so, so in Windows I have also, f I have a check also if I have it already installed. If I have it already installed, don't install it again. So if I have that directory, if the file exists, so if I have a saga command line already on my machine, that means I have it installed because that's the that's the key um, uh, keys um, file we need to have. So the Saga command line. So if I have it on my machine, then there's no need to Saga GS already installed. You see. If I don't have the file, so you don't have a Saga GS, then what do I do? First thing I have to create this. 
if this file name is missing, the saga zip, then I would just say it's x64. So I assume it's a 64-bit version of saga. And then I get the, I generate the name of the directory which saga.js will produce. And then I can download the file. Then I unzip the file. Then I create a directory where I want to put it. And then I do a X copy. So this is a, this is actually a DOS, this is a DOS version to copy all the files from one folder to the other folder. And then I can also unlink means delete. So delete all the temporary, uh, temporary files which you decompressed. So how do we run this uh, function? Well, um, I have to source all this code. So you see here this thing, source. So I can source, I can source the whole script. You see nothing happens because the only thing that happened is that I loaded that function install. So I loaded that function in my memory. That's the only thing I did. Okay, and now if I do install saga.js, it tries to install it. In my case, I already have it installed, so it went very quick and it says, it's installed. You see, saga.js already installed and um, it finds the command line and it's in my uh, r saga saga underscore vc. This is where, so saga js and r saga develop independently. And so uh, there's no, they don't meet and there's no really, they don't work, they don't have to work as a group. Uh, so what, what Alex does, he says, okay, you can put your saga js whatever you like, but there are some default places where we'll, where we'll look for it. And one of the default places is under the R saga directory, under your R installation of the R saga. If you have a directory saga underscore VC, this is where the R saga is going to look for saga GS. Okay, so did you try to run that function if it is downloading or is it doing something? It might not work this function because I also have administrator rights on my laptop. And so I can, I can put files wherever I like and I can do things. And if you don't have administrator rights, maybe it, will, it won't allow you to uh, do uh, uh, moving files on your computer. So the system will say, no, you don't have rights to move to this directory. That's a, there's a good chance for that. Did you try running that? Are, are you are Linux, right? Yes, but I have the same problem as well. Yeah. Did you manage to source the file? And then you say saga. No, so your didn't work. Yes. So your, your says it's not working. So um, I mean, you did download it, but it didn't. Okay, you did run everything correctly, but it didn't find it. So, um, so you see, there's the, there's the, uh, it downloaded it, but it looks like it didn't want to copy. But I don't get any, any message that it didn't want to copy. Uh, no, then you call only the function. You have to clo uh, open close bracket. So, if you oh. go to this, the, yeah. Let's see now. Because I, I've already installed it, so just... So now you see it's, in, it's, you all, you can run it once and let's see if it works. It might not work, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, I have it here. It's in the working directory. Yeah, okay. And if you, you have to, so, uh, I, I did. Uh, just be careful, you know, in your history, you're working in your history. So don't, don't type in the history, you just type, you just work with this one. So let's close this one. And here you can also say, yeah, switch to environment or something. So don't, don't work with the history okay. and open the script. 
So if you go file open or here, open, yeah. Open the script, yeah. Let's see. So there's the script here, and now you have to do source. Source the script. And now you see you have an install saga, and then you install saga with uh, with the open close brackets. So see, that's, that's the function I call. So I have to open close brackets because if I don't do that, then it just prints the function. Open close brackets means really call that function with the default parameters. That's what it means. I don't have to set them because I, I put the default parameters. Okay, so who managed to get, once you get this thing, so when the R saga, when it runs the R saga environment, and once you get this, so the CMD file, it's recognized, then, then we have a, a link established. No? Let's see, 2.1.1, it's not a problem. Okay. So you can still work with it. So yeah, no problem. I was wondering, is this because I'm using Ubuntu and I try to upgrade the thing and yeah. I've got no upgrade? It's possible, yeah. Because, yeah, because they have to compile for uh, Ubuntu. Somebody, like, you know, Saga GS people don't compile things for Ubuntu. So there are other people that then, you know, just want to help and then they make it, but they can be late, so... But it's really, it's a very small difference, so don't worry about it. Yeah, it, now it's here in the folder. Yep. It's, but it didn't extract, so I don't know if I should do it manually. Or. Okay, so the, I was hoping that we would be able to get this function to work, but I also know that everybody has a different computer, and you have also German, you, you can have a German Windows, and it, there could be some differences, and if you don't have administrator rights that that also makes a difference. So there's a, another possibility to install uh, Saga.js in a much easier way, probably, is to uh, go to the, uh, so the Saga.js uh, project. So we'll show you where the things are. So that's on the source forge. And, and you see that there's a Windows installation, that's the one that they recommend by default, but it's a 32-bit. So you can also just um, download that zip file and extract it to a directory where it wants. Or even easier, if you go under files, so if I go under files, and then I go to Saga GS 2.1, and I go to Saga 2.12. I don't see, by the way, 2.13. I don't know where you got that. So I see only Saga... So here's the Saga 2.12, right? So I don't see 2.13. Okay. Um, so and so if I go to this directory, uh, then you can see most downloaded is this 32, but there's also a, a setup, there's a exe, so compiled for Windows, so you can also just download the setup and then you can, you can run the setup. The problem will be then you really need administrator rights. If you don't have administrator rights on your laptop, then you won't be able to do that. Okay, so if you if you tried running this function, uh, and if you don't get, so if you, when you do the, uh, so that's the key function, this one here. When I do this, when I run this, then I have to get so this is a healthy connection. When I run the uh, rsaga.env, so rsaga environment, if I get um, if I get rsaga to find this, then I have a healthy connection. So connection established. Until you get that, it means you don't have the connection. So who has the healthy connection established? One, two, three, and tr and you also got it. Okay, and you too. We still have to work on that. I mean, I already installed it yesterday, and it is checking something. So I have Saga on my computer. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
The problem is, look at this. So if I do some simple uh, computing, so let me check on some examples. Um, well, actually, I just just look at this one. So here are some examples. Um, so you can uh, you can also set up your environment path. You can set up it manually. You can say, you can put it anywhere. And you, but then you have to say every time you use our Saga, you have to s specify where is your uh, Saga JS. So let me copy this because it probably is too small. So I'll copy that into my code. Actually, I'll make a new one. Yeah, so I can also say, well, my uh, my Saga JS is under C Saga data, whatever. Uh, it's the data, and then Saga JS is the path, but then every time I run some command like do a hill shading, then I have to say environment is my environment. You see? If I if I if I put Saga JS in where our Saga looks for Saga JS, so when you run the default settings, and if I get a, a healthy link, it means I don't have to define ever again where my Saga JS is. So I. Of course, I recommend to you to just to put it where the R saga looks for it. Well, it will look for it at different places. I mean, yeah, I will. I will do this. Look, I can do this for you just because it's, this is a training session. So look, I will delete. My whole, oh, yeah, I cannot delete because I have a Saga.js open. So now I have this Saga.js installed ready, but I just go and say, no, delete it. You see, there's no, I don't install it. I can just decompress the binaries. I can use it. So there's no deinstallation. Just delete the whole folder. Okay, so now if I look at my, it's very simple. If I look at my R Saga environment, I get nothing. It says, well, there's no Saga.js. And these are all the parts where, so this is my Windows parts, and it and it looks for all this. Said, so well, I'm looking under Windows, Windows System, Program Files, you know, I'm looking all, all the parts that you have. I'm looking for Saga JS, and I don't find any Saga uh, CMD. But you see, on the top of the list, the default place where we look for is the subdirectory of the R Saga package. Okay, so so I said, okay, it's not it's not here, and so that's why I made this function, and I say install. Saga and install me the using default so it goes and downloads it and then we'll extract and I can even look live I mean I can look what happens in the directory you will see it will create a directory and then it will copy all the files so yes that that's my recommendation that's the best under Linux is a different place Maybe, but uh, under Windows, it's uh, uh, it's the R Saga directory. I think this one is still downloading. Sorry. Yeah, you have to change. Then the if the version changes, then you might have to change. Anyway, I didn't make like official function to install Saga.js. I'm just showing you that for me also sometimes, as soon as I see, okay, it works, some function works for me, I will use it for myself and I know it works. It might not work for you, but uh, I do tend to put everything in functions eventually. Everything I can, I put in function, functions. Oh, I think I'm still downloading. Yeah, 
and still down. Maybe, maybe now because we are all uh, uh, pointing to the source forge, maybe it, it puts us a bit on the hold. But now I actually have to wait till I get this. I'm looking at. Could be that in my case something got stuck because I see a zero, zero kilobyte. Okay, let me try to interrupt and then rerun it. So something happened in my case, so it doesn't want to download and it's hanging. Okay, so actually officially I have to restart my yeah no it actually I stopped it but it was it was uh, downloading a piece of the file it is a it is a bit big file okay let's try one more time this one is really not printing the progress so I don't see the progress of download so I'll, I'll just have to wait a bit um, yeah so that's one possibility is to just extract the binary uh, files so that's what I said I said with the saga JS, I like it it's very portable you know and I have you can have even put like a three versions of saga JS when I do some testing and I put them on three places where uh, where I know it is, and then I can I can compare the old Saga JS and the new Saga JS. So it's very portable, very easy. You can also really install it in. You run the installation on the Windows, uh, but then you have to pick up a, a, some default directory. I think it's program file Saga uh, minus GS. That's that's the default directory, and that's Argo is going to find it there. So as long as you keep the default directory, you'll be fine. Okay, let's see the progress here. Do you see the progress on your on your session when you're downloading? Does it show the progress? Yeah, you see, I, I don't see the progress. I'm not sure why. Uh, well, I'm on a cable, so it should work. So do you all have the Saga JS installed on your machines? So then the next thing which is a good good thing to do is to put a shortcut, the Saga JS shortcut if you put it on your desktop. If you put it on your desktop so you don't have to go to that directory all the time. You just put it on the desktop and that means you can always go uh, go back to just the desktop and you double click it. Once you double click it, it's the one with the Remember that one I da, da, uh, when I clicked on the one with the icon, and then you can get the Saga GS. You get the the, the logo, and then the Saga GS loads. It, it's all, anywhere it can find it. And or you can also do it where it cannot find it, yeah. but uh, then you have to specify the environment every time. And does it work if I um, work in directory if I cannot have it? Will that still work? Uh, no, it will always work. I mean, if you if you copy all the files from the binary, so if you do installation, so uh, then the only issue is that the R saga has to find saga.js. 
And so either it's on the place where it know it is, so there's all these paths that uh, R look, uh, the R saga looks for, and if it cannot find it on the paths, you can add it to the Windows path in your environmental uh, variable settings, or you can just say, well, every time I run a uh, R saga command, I say I'm look using my environment and I say my saga JS is here. So that's this thing I showed you here. You see, I can say, um, my path is saga, C saga GS, you see? Once I, I specify this, so I specify my, where my saga GS is, then every time I run any command, so if I do hill shading, then I have to say environment is my environment. If, if our saga finds it by default, uh, 